Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And today we are going to look at uh, this interesting case from a 69 year old male. Great. You're probably getting close to 69 yourself. God, can you imagine that? <laughs> Um, I hope I never get a lung biopsy. That's probably not. Key. That wouldn't be good. You sh you have to tell us one day your story about your bronchoscopy, though. Oh yeah, yeah, and I do have video of that. Oh, <laughs> well, you can show the video of that if you want. Okay, this is this is a 69 year old male. History of end stage renal disease. That may or may not be important. And he's on hemodialysis. He's right. on the transplant list, waiting right. for a transplant. He's on dialysis. He's on dialysis. Oh, yeah. that does change a few things for us. It does, right? Because sometimes hemorrhage and pigment in the lung in a patient on chronic dialysis may not mean the same thing right. out of that context. In fact, it's expected in patients on hemodialysis. Exactly. So this patient uh, had some increasing shortness of breath over the course of two months or so, had imaging studies that showed pretty impressive infiltrates, and ended up having this uh, surgical wedge biopsy. So that evolution clinically, well, what do you think? I mean... It's kind of a subacute presentation. Yeah, and infection would be weird. I mean, there are some infections, if you're immunocompromised, that you can smolder with, like mycobacterial disease. And patients who are uremic on hemodialysis are at increased risk of infection, but not like our big-time immunosuppressed patients, like right. chemotherapy, uh, immunosuppression, transplantation, yeah. etc., right. HIV. So we got to consider infection, but maybe not at the top of our list. Right. So what do you think of this biopsy from low power? Well, it's a good surgical biopsy. Uh, it's pretty red. It's, and, and, you know, when, when you red. have a bloody biopsy like this with fresh blood, <clears throat> I think it, 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 it it's daunting. Uh, the first thing you do is look under the microscope. You say, how am I going to ever see anything here in this red sea? Yeah, especially blood? from low power when you're on the microscope, right? You have the condenser down, the red just... The, the red blood cell obscures everything. everything. You yeah. can't really see what's going on. So then we they call you, Max, and you say, well, try to ignore the blood. You say, okay, that should be something I could do, but I doubt I'll actually achieve it. So what we want to do is stay at low magnification to see if there are any clues that will help us focus and keep from getting lost in this sea of red cells. And I think, to me, at low mag, I'm seeing nodules here, yeah, which I yeah, vague nodules, vague nodules, but they're blue, right? And blue is always something you want to pay attention to <clears throat> in the surgical biopsy. It, it's a focal point. It means there's some other increased cellularity here. So I think we want to focus there. So let's let's go down and take a look around to see what the neighborhood looks like. Okay, but just real quick. With regard to fresh red blood cells in air spaces like this, right. the vast majority of the time you see that on a surgical wedge biopsy is probably related to the procedure. Right. So if if you call this intraalveolar hemorrhage, right. fresh intraalveolar hemorrhage, most of the time when we see people call things that, it's probably just related to the biopsy procedure. Right, right. It's almost an artifact, if you will. And you might ask the question, is this the patient at increased risk? for bleeding from a surgical procedure and maybe the patient on chronic dialysis might, might have risk factors. So I think the red blood cells that are intact in the biopsy are never as important as other attributes related to hemorrhage like hemosiderin, which develops quickly within a few hours of bleeding, the red cells break down and produce this brown pigment absorbed typically in macrophages. macrophages. So to me, the neighborhood here, we're in one of the nodules, very cellular, very busy, and these little brown serpiginous areas with exactly. macrophages. So hemosiderin laden macrophages or smoker's macrophages? Good question. How do you tell the difference? Well, sometimes it can be difficult, but I think what you try to look for is coarseness to the pigment. Smoker's macrophages tend to be very, so fine in pigmentation that it looks really like smoke. It's dust. Right, very fine Very dust. fine dust. And here, I think we start seeing aggregation of brown pigment and that sort of chunky inclusion brown pigment always brings hemosiderin from hemorrhage 
uh, in, to the forefront. We also have some fiber in here. Now, that's a nice wow. little view right there. Sure. What do you think? Well, so uh, I was going to say one other thing about the about the hemosiderin. Uh, you know, iron stains will be positive both in smokers' macrophages and in hemosiderin-laden macrophages. But the iron actually can be very helpful in helping you see that coarse granularity right. of the pigment in hemosiderin as compared to the smokers' macrophages, which have that very finely stippled blue staining on right. the on the iron stain. Right. So you're right. To me, I mean, this in this setting, this patient, this is a very characteristic uh, histologic appearance, and it actually gives us a lot of information about what's going on in this case. Uh, we have the hemosiderin-laden macrophages, we and we have fibrin, and the fibrin has in, is is incorporating both hemosiderin-laden macrophages and fresh red blood cells. Right. So that tells me the fibrin tells me acute lung injury. Right. The hemosiderin laden macrophages tell me the bleeding's been going on for a while. And the fresh red blood cells mean there's bleeding going on right now. Right. So we have the past, the present, and not yet the future? Not yet the future. We have okay. to look for the future. We have to look for the future. What is going to cause the future? Right. So with the things we've described, we're thinking about a pulmonary hemorrhage. Real pathologic pulmonary hemorrhage. And most people associate that with vasculitis in the lung. Now, for pathologists looking at a lung biopsy, I can tell you that if you find a pulmonary artery with acute inflammation in it, it's more likely to be related to something other than a true vasculitis. Because most of the vasculitis in the lung that's significant is microvascular. It's the inflammation. It's, right. It's the capillary network that, that it gets the vasculitis, and that's right. why we end up calling it a capillaritis, because it's more the capillary network. I mean, here's two vessels right here. They look pristine. Right. And what, nobody would look at these vessels and say that looks like a capillaritis. Right. So our job, once we see this, I think, I think we have diagnostic features of acute and organizing alveolar hemorrhage. And the organizing might be hard to tell here. But there are some immature fibroblasts mixed in here. We just don't have big polyps of it, right? Right, right. So acute and organizing alveolar hemorrhage. And our next real step is to be able to identify the capillaritis. Yeah, it's almost an emergent thing now. Oh, yeah. Once you've made a commitment to acute and organizing pulmonary hemorrhage, your next step has to be within the next 20 minutes, make a phone call. See if you can find the capillaritis and right. then make a phone call. Because... Most of the things on the differential diagnosis for acute and organizing alveolar hemorrhage, especially with capillaritis, are immunologic mediated disease processes, and these patients can end up bleeding out and dying, basically right. drowning. Catastrophic, in their blood. catastrophic pulmonary hemorrhage, and you don't want to be on the end of having had a biopsy in your hands while the patient is uh, somewhere in the hospital bleeding to death. Exactly. So where would you suggest we go about looking for capillaritis? I mean, we have a lot of uh, surface area on this biopsy, and capillaritis can be a very focal finding. So where would you suggest we look for capillaritis? Well, just like Willie Sutton, right? If you're looking for money, go to a bank. And these areas of nodular increased cellularity with lots of hemosiderin are going to be the prime locations, especially with fibrin. So I would look for the most hemosiderin, the most fibrin within a cellular nodule, and I go to high magnification and I cruise around, and 9.9 .9 out of 10 times you're gonna be rewarded with a small strip of interstitium with capillaries buzzing around, uh, with neutrophils, sorry, buzzing around it like bees around a flower. Exactly. So and right, maybe, maybe in there, it can be that really might subtle. Be a neutrophil. And people say, are you kidding? But our, our sensitivity is so high now in this context, we're looking for any clue that might help. And as soon as we see it, we're going to dial 911 call, or the clinicians. Call the pulmonologist. Call the pulmonologist. Or whoever's Or the care, intensive care The intensivist, the critical care uh, doctor. So here's another little bit of a neutrophil here. Right. And you say, well, they're not inside the capillary network. <laughs> But you can't see the capillary network anymore because it's obscured by this acute inflammatory process. So if you see two or three neutrophils, literally, in a row, they're in the interstitium. Then the interstitium, where is the alveolar wall here? It's incorporated in this mix. You can't tell anymore, right? Right. right. 
So what's the importance of, uh, of this patient's uh, history? Remember, he's on hemodialysis for his end-stage renal disease. Right. Well, we don't know the cause of his end-stage renal disease. We, can, we can't jump to the fact that he might have that on the basis of uh, vasculitic syndrome, but he could. Uh, he's on dialysis. I mean, it's a complicated picture. You got potential for episodic uremia. Right. But if he, I mean, so let's say he did have end-stage renal disease due to a glomerular nephritis. Right. That kind of puts the whole picture together. Right. Right. Now the patient has a systemic vasculitis. He's got multi-organ involvement. Right. The disease has already blown through his kidneys, and now he's, he's showing pulmonary manifestations of it. Right. It is so they don't always go in the order you expect them to. Like, if you have a pulmonary hemorrhage, it doesn't mean the kidney's going to follow, but it may, and right. vice versa. So are you going to call up and say, uh, this patient has uh, microscopic polyangitis? I would call the clinician and say, look, I've got an alveolar hemorrhage problem here. And I think that's an, that this is an active nodular microvasculitis. So if the patient is acutely ill now, which probably is because they went for a surgical lung biopsy, that's kind of an act of desperation in the setting. In, in this setting, it's definitely an act of desperation, yes. So I think we need, to, we need to make sure the clinician knows that the possibility of a catastrophic immunologically mediated hemorrhage in this patient is there and we don't want to miss it. So if the patient's not on steroid at this point, I would suggest on the phone, honestly, and I've done this hundreds of times to, with clinicians, put the patient on solumedrol now. You're a pathologist? Right. I'm a pathologist who doesn't want <laughs> to be in the limelight of having stood by and watched this patient die. I mean, I do think we have a patient care obligation. Absolutely. And to me, a little solumedrol in this setting to give us a chance to catch our breath is not a bad idea. For sure. So we've been looking around as we've been looking at this, and the capillaritis is really hard to find. All we see are a few collections of neutrophils right. here and there. Right. But I'm still, based on this setting, hemosiderin-related macrophages, fibrin, the edema, the, the lack of... The nodular appearance The nodular it. appearance, the lack of really being able to see the clear-cut alveolar walls and, and the capillary network all points to me that this is an active capillaritis, right. even though it's difficult to find the, the specific areas. And I think that's okay in some right. cases. Right. I sometimes say, with subtle changes suggesting capillaritis in my report, in other words, I put it out there that I did look for it, and I was... I sort of hallucinated areas that looked a little too busy in that fragmented way that neutrophils uh, appear when they get outside of the capillaries. Right. So what, did we have a story on what happened to this patient? So this patient ended up having an onca. As I recall, it was a, a P onca mm. positivity. Uh, and so... Um, so Interesting. Pro he probably has a systemic uh, onca-associated vasculitis. Uh, and his renal disease was probably posse immune, uh, glomerular nephritis. Wow. wow, complicated case. Glad you were here. Glad, glad you were here. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it for, for this case. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and comment below. Great. Thank you.